So probably one of the biggest misconceptions about NIL is that it is paying students to play sports. Uh, they also think that it's going to ruin um, uh, amateur sports because the whole na the whole notion of being an amateur is that it, you're, you're playing for the love of the game and not for compensation. Um, however, actually, with NIL, this is not about pay for play. With NIL, what this is really all is about is being able to leverage your copyrights. That's why NIL stands for Name, Image, and Likeness. The the, 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 the case that, that basically brought NIL to front is the Ed O'Bannon case. And you know, he was a you know, popular athlete and uh, he and his brother were popular athletes you know, in, in, uh, in, in a NCAA tournament in the Sweet 16. And for years and years and years, um, schools and even the NCAA used this likeness in video games and so forth, but he never got paid for those things. Uh, the, N the NCAA basically had what amounts to is a monopoly on the copyrights. Um, with social media, that became really hard to enforce simply because uh, people are already leveraging their own name, image, and likeness. And so they ended up, there ends up being an inherent conflict between an era of social media and influence and schools monetizing assets that many of these student athletes probably already have av readily available to a large following. So uh, what this is allowed for, I think, um, again, when you start talking about one of the bis biggest misconceptions, they're thinking it's ruining uh, amateur sports. I really believe that it is developing um, a long-term career options for student athletes that are even beyond their, their time and play that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. It's allow, it allows them to become business owners, to become um, owners of assets and to start thinking more strategically uh, like business entities and as businessmen and women. Um, uh, it also, it's, it's been really fair in terms of gender inequality, where the student athletes, young women student athletes are doing just as well in, uh, in NIL valuation as the, as the young men who are playing these sports. So um, I think that overall, it's gonna be really good for uh, helping to even change you know, generational uh, uh, poverty in some cases for kids who are coming from uh, you know, low income communities, they get, get a chance to develop uh, a business and some assets early on, again, even before uh, they graduate and, and go on. Because to be honest, like, let's, let's, let's be real honest, less than 2% of collegiate athletes go on to the next level and play professionally. And so what do you do with this, this glut, 98% plus of student athletes who, you know, go from high school being a superstar, go on college and doing well, and then most of them don't make it to the next level. Well, what you do is you allow them to, um, to be able to get as much leverage as possible out of that playing time and to build a legacy um, from, from something that they did and they love and they can continue to do be even beyond their play time. So um, I think that uh, the biggest uh, misconception about it is that it's, it's gonna be something that's gonna harm the game, it's gonna, it's gonna hurt the student athlete. Um, and I, I think it's probably, um, once we sort of get it sort of worked out so that it, it's fair uh, across the board for you know, HBCUs to, to top D1 NCAA programs, I think there's some inequities that are gonna be there that once they get those things worked out, um, I think that it, you know, I think that everyone will see that this is a, it's a good time. It's a good, it's a good uh, opportunity uh, for, for the schools, uh, the programs and the students involved.